Hello and welcome to this webinar on rethinking energy in Southeast Asia. My name is Malin and I will be the moderator of this session. While we're letting everyone come online, perhaps those of you who are here uh, could open the chat box at the bottom of your window and introduce yourself, um, where you're calling in from and your company. Please choose all attendees, then we can all uh, read your messages. A few practicalities um, for asking questions please use the Q&A box, which is at the bottom of your toolbar. Then we can more easily keep track of the incoming questions and make sure we don't lose them. So the Q&A box and the chat box are, are separate. This session is being recorded and you will receive the recording in a few days. So let's take a look at the chat box here. Uh, yeah, we have some people calling in from around the region. That's great. Um, please keep on introducing yourselves there. But let's kick off. Um, I'm shortly going to introduce the uh, agenda and the speakers. But of course, Carolyn and Nicholas, you can say some additional words about yourself as well when you start your presentations. Um, but let me start with myself. Uh, my name is Malin Estman. Uh, I'm based in Singapore and heading the market development and strategy for Middle East and Asia area in Vatsila's energy business. Vartsila is a technology company um, offering solutions and lifecycle services for the marine and energy markets. In the energy business, we want to support countries and our customers in the energy transition by enabling the use of more renewable energy through complementing flexible technologies. The first presentation today will be uh, by Carolyn Chua from Bloomberg. She is focusing on Southeast Asia and will share some background on the global energy transition as well as a market outlook. Then we will hear from Nicolas Leon, who is the Energy Business Director for North and Southeast Asia in Vartsila. He will talk about the role of flexibility in supporting power systems. The presentations will be followed um, by a panel discussion between the three of us and, of course, questions from the audience. So please be active asking questions in the Q&A box. Um, for comments or reflections or a bit of networking, you can, of course, continue in the separate chat box um, as well. Now I will hand over to Carolyn. Uh, Carolyn, uh, please uh, also unmute yourself. Yes. Thanks, Marlin, for the kind introduction. Uh, just to check that everyone can see and hear me okay. That's great. So good afternoon. Oh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today. So as Marlene can introduce, my name is Caroline Chua, and I'm an analyst with Bloomberg NES based out of the Singapore office. And in my day to day, I focus on power market, uh, renewable energy development and policy across the Southeast Asia region. And what I'd like to share today is some of the energy transition outlook and trends that we are seeing in the power sector, both globally and in Southeast Asia. So just very briefly, for those who might not be too familiar with us, uh, Bloomberg NES or BNES uh, is a strategic research provider. And we're currently a group of about 250 professionals seated in about 17 locations around the world. And we cover the global commodity markets and technologies across different sectors that are driving the transition to a low carbon economy. So across all the sectors uh, that you see on the screen. And well, where I'd like to start today um, is with this chart. And this chart is one of the outputs from one of BNEF's uh, annual flagship report called the New Energy Outlook, which is our long-term scenario analysis on the future of energy. And this year we published two scenarios, an economic transition scenario, which looks at a economic flat pathway out to 2050, uh, excluding long-term policy targets. So we stripped out all policy effects. And we also looked at a climate scenario, and this year it's that specifically investigates a clean electricity and hydrogen pathway to reduce greenhouse gas emissions to keep climate change uh, well below the two degree scenario. And for this presentation, I'll focus on the results from the economic transition scenario, which is what you see on screen here. And this is how we think the global power system could look like if power markets around the world develop on a least cost basis uh, case out, out to 2050. 
And the result is that coal suffers the most in our economic transition scenario. By 2050, the share of coal drops to just 12% from 35% in 2019, as plants retire and the technology becomes increasingly uncompetitive. By 2031, generation from wind and solar itself actually outpaced um, the global uh, generation from coal plants. And by 2050, zero carbon technologies make up three quarters of global generation, with wind and solar accounting for about 56% of that. So we're going to see quite a drastic shift um, over the next three decades in the global power system. And underpinning this outlook really is a technology story. So across all the technologies that we track. Uh, and what you see here is what the NEF has tracked over the last decade or so. I believe we have uh, data points going far further back than that. Uh, but we see the decline in price uh, with the rising in cumulative in-stock capacity that is shown uh, in gray on the chart. And from these data points, uh, we can actually extract what we call experience curve that describes the relationship between price and volume. And what we have observed so far are very strong cost decline stories. Taking TV, for example, we observe around a 29% learning rate, which is a 29% reduction in price for its doubling of cumulative install capacity on the ground. And it's not just a unit cost decline story that we're seeing. The equipments are also getting better, whether that's higher PV module efficiencies, uh, better wind capacity factors, bigger turbines that can extract more wind, or improved battery energy density. The machines are getting better, and hence can do more across the power system. And more efficient equipment also means that systems can be smaller uh, to achieve the same amount of generation, and this lowers balance of plant costs, engineering, your procurement and construction costs, uh, keeping or driving the cost of generation down. And when we look back to 2014, um, we, we see this map which shows the cheapest source of bulk generation for each country across the world. And you see that a lot of them are in gray, uh, which is for gas or black for coal. Um, and we see that coal and gas Yes, largely provided the cheapest source of power generation across the world. And around just 1% of the world's population live in a place where solar and wind were the cheapest source of new generation on a dollar per megawatt hour basis uh, back in 2014. The same map today, just six years later, shows a very different story. And what we find is that wind and TV are now the cheapest source of new electricity across the world. In countries representing two thirds of the world's population, or about 73% of global GDP. In many parts of APEC, um, especially here in Southeast Asia, you can see on the screen, coal remains the cheapest source of generation today. But we also expect this to change uh, fairly quickly over the next few years. Uh, furthermore, uh, it is also likely that in the next five years or so, we will come to a second tipping point, which is uh, when it will be cheaper to build new wind or solar plants than to run existing coal gas plant on a dollar per megawatt hour basis um, across much of the world's economy. And that includes you know, countries with very coal heavy power systems right now, such as in China, or places with very cheap gas, such as in the United States. And when all these cost factors and improved efficiency factors come together, uh, the result is that in an economic split pathway, uh, the result is that the wind and solar grow to reach very deep penetrations all around the world, from 54% in China to around 80% in Germany and Spain um, by 2050. And by the end of the outlook, uh, what we see is that power systems no longer run with very large thermal plants running at base load capacity factors uh, supported by smaller bigger units, such as in the picture of Germany in 2020. But instead, um, we see this split to a new paradigm of cheap uh, but inflexible bulk renewable energy generation 
supported by increased flexibility such as batteries, demand side uh, flexibility, peak of gas, and fossil fuel plants running at very low capacity factors, uh, a lot of the time even below the optimize, uh, optimal utilization levels. And uh, under the economic transition scenario, uh, about $15 trillion uh, of investment is needed for new power capacity, out of which 11% or about $1.7 trillion goes to batteries and peak of gas to support the increasing flexibility requirements in power grids. So what the that all means for Southeast Asia, and I summed it up with one line here, which is despite the existing challenges in development, we actually do observe increasing renewable energy momentum, which uh, moving forward will require grid operators to rethink how grids have to be managed. And um, perhaps I'd like to show this picture, which is you know the, the asset financing that we've tracked for renewable capacity across Southeast Asia. Um, and ASEAN has often be, been said to be a laggard in renewable energy development. But the last two years have really shown us how quickly things can move uh, here in Southeast Asia. So in 2018, we observed a record year for renewable financing, largely driven by the solar rush in Vietnam uh, due to the expiry of the very first solar fitted tariffs in June 2019. 2020, again, we saw was a record high year for asset financing, again, led by uh, solar and wind development in Vietnam. And if we look at the snapshot of, uh, of a few of the, the regional power systems right now, what we observe is that most of them are currently dominated by coal and gas plants, so thermal power plants. Um, but we expect renewable energy development to grow over the next few years again, led by Vietnam, as you can see uh, on the chart on the right. Um, but not every country is expected to reach the scale witness in Vietnam over the last few years, uh, based on the current regulatory framework and policies and government ambitions that are in place. But again, just to, just to highlight, we have seen how quickly things can change once the support framework is in place, and this chart can change very quickly um, based on new announcements uh, that could come out of these countries here in the region. And when we look at the coal side of things, um, what we see is that new coal power projects will likely face challenges in terms of financing uh, as they're increasing coal phase out commitments from investors. So a large number of global bank financial institutions have now announced plans to stop find, funding new coal projects. And many lenders and investors are also pushing clients to reduce their revenue dependency on coal. And when we look at you know, the historical funding and financing for coal projects, we saw that a significant portion of capital for private coal power plants in Indonesia and Vietnam, two of the largest coal markets in Southeast Asia and two of the countries which has the largest pipeline forward a significant portion of, of lending has come from lender states in China, Japan, and South Korea. All three countries have since announced net zero pledges towards the end of 2020. And this may lead to increased review, scrutiny, and tightening of policies on the financing of overseas coal projects. And we have seen some movements towards that. So for example, the, Japan, uh, the government of Japan has announced the withdrawal of state bank support for overseas coal uh, projects. And lawmakers in South Korea have also proposed bills uh, to prevent government-backed companies or banks from pursuing global coal projects. While all these do not yet amount to a full ban on coal financing, there are steps towards, you know, tending towards a future where there will be a winding down of, of financing towards uh, global coal projects. And it's not just coal that's facing, you know, not just coal facing additional increases. We have seen observed regional governments uh, and the power development plans of these nations signaling quite a firm pivot towards uh, renewables and away from coal. And one example really is Vietnam, where they're currently drafting their next power development plan, PDP-8, 
uh, where it's said to be targeting a much lower portion of coal plants. And in fact, several plant coal plants in Vietnam uh, have faced delays or are canceled or have been proposed to switch to gas plants due to objections from you know, provincial governments. And the government themselves have also called for reduced reliance in coal and increased prioritization of renewables for its overall energy sector. And in the Philippines as well, the Department of Energy announced a moratorium on new green fuel coal projects uh, last year. Uh, the moratorium excludes uh, expansion plans of committed pipeline projects uh, but new coal plants will not be allowed to be developed. And when you look at under their latest Philippine energy plan, we see that they've included a clean energy scenario, uh, which targets for a much lower share of coal in its power system as well. And on the renewable front, we are seeing increasing ambition for renewable energy, especially solar, and support frameworks from the government, which is an increasing uh, which is an encouraging sign for the renewable industry. So just to point out a few countries here, uh, for example, in Indonesia, which has always been a challenging market uh, for renewable energy development because of the regulations that they currently have in place, there are now discussions of potentially reintroducing a fit and tariff scheme uh, for renewable energy projects. Uh, there are talks of a re renewable energy regulation and there, the government has also announced, you know, that they will be constructing solar parks to help support large-scale solar developments in, in the country. And even the newer markets, such as Myanmar, Cambodia, we've seen them over the last few years come out with very ambitious solar targets and leapfrogging to auctions with relatively successful uh, results and, and low bids, uh, which we'll get to uh, in a few slides later. So, and, and, and this is what I've mentioned in the previous slides, uh, which is, you know, despite the relatively small base of renewable energy projects deployed in the region apart from Vietnam, um, we have seen quite competitive pricing from solar auctions. So for example, the chart on the left that shows uh, the bid received uh, in Malaysia's large-scale solar auctions. And the fourth large-scale solar auction continued to receive lower bids than previous rounds despite you know, the smaller parcel size and limitation on foreign participation. And in Cambodia's very first solar park auction, they also yield a competitive tariff of below $40 per megawatt hour, which was largely helped by the auction design in how these are allocated. It really goes to show that despite the small base um, that's deployed in the region right now, solar is already a competitive uh, source of new power generation. And the last point that I'd like to highlight uh, for the presentation today is what this means in terms of uh, you know, the operations of the grid and what this means for battery energy storage projects and flexibility. So the deployment of stationary battery systems in the region has historically been limited uh, with a lot of the installations being part of pilot projects or as part of micro and mini grids in rural areas. Um, however, as renewable energy pen penetration continues to grow in the regional power systems, you know, operators would to rethink how systems have to be managed. And one area would be the increased requirement for flexibility, be it to shift generation uh, to when demand is to align the two profiles or to address grid constraint issues or renewable output curtailment issues such as is happening in Vietnam right now. And so at this point, we expect policy discussions on storage and development will likely increase moving forward. And we have seen Philippines currently taking the lead with a lot of pipeline projects, um, it, uh, pipeline projects post in the country so far. And I'm sure we'll hear more about this uh, in the subsequent presentation. So I'd like to end my presentation here today uh, and hand the time back over to Marlin. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Carolyn. Um, Nicholas, over to you. Yes, hi, Marlene. Just, uh, just a bit of, let me just try to share my screen. Sorry for that. Let me just try to do it.
Now you should be able to see the screen, right? Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, to those on the line, uh, good morning and uh, good afternoon uh, to you. Uh, very glad to be with you today. Uh, my name is Nicholas uh, and I'm the director for North and Southeast Asia, uh, looking after our energy business and greetings from all of, all of you, from myself, uh, from Tokyo, Japan. So today, what I'm going to, to talk to you today, I'm going to talk to you about what is the role of, of flexibility and how can this support the renewable energy transition and the power system. We have a very deep um, understanding of the energy transition and the power system. And with that, we are able to help our customer to find the, the optimal path and the most efficient one towards a 100% renewable energy while future-proofing their power system. What I mean by future-proofing, meaning that you will need to invest in the right technology now that will be part of this energy transition so that if you invest in the wrong technology today, that technology, that asset could be actually be obsolete and you might need to decommission that. So really what is important now is to make the right decision, to make the right investment so that you're able that you future-proof your power system. And we have a wide range of flexibility portfolio, such as flexible gas power plant and energy storage. And all of that is backed up with very strong worldwide service network so that we can accompany our customer, our partner throughout this journey towards more renewable in the system. So if we look at the role of flexibility, increasing renewable energy system requires multiple forms of flexibility. And you can see here, you have daily uh, variation in generation. So these are mainly handled by energy storage. And then from daily, you move to weekly. So when you, need, you, have, you need to have longer generation for energy balance. And this could be supported by flexible gas power plant. And then if you go to more longer, like a seasonal type, that's where we need to look at as a fuel for the form of energy storage. And this, you could have like uh, power to gas and using uh, existing uh, LNG infrastructure is required. So now you have seen about various type of uh, various role of flexibility. So now let's look at this, uh, this slide here where we are show you on that particular day, 11 of May, 2020, where actually there was a record in terms of renewable energy. As you can see here, a lot of countries, almost 50% of countries in Europe actually has a very great share of renewable, almost more than 50%. And some countries, those top one had actually been almost close to 100%. So what we want to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, that the energy transition is happening, it's happening now, and renewable is coming because it's getting more cheaper and cheaper. And I think that's something that all of us here need to, to realize that this is the reality that the energy transition is happening. In some cases, like in Europe, it's happening faster. Here in Southeast Asia, it's happening. Some countries even have uh, more faster. But I think what we all need to know that we need to be prepared for it because when it happens, you want to be part of it. If you're not part of it, you will be left at the back and your asset will not be dispatched. So I think you need to make the, the smart decision now so that you invest in the right technology now. So now we stay in Europe and we see what happened in Germany during the lockdown. So Germany with the current uh, power system, they were not able to shut down their base load gas plant. And as you know, in, in Germany, there's a high penetration of renewable and on those particular day, as you can see here in the month of April, you can see that actually there was a very high renewable generation, 72%. And as a result, Germany needed to pay its neighbors to actually take the energy away. 
And this is something that is not efficient. This is something that you don't want that to pay people to, to export uh, excess electricity. And this is some of the work that we actually have developed. So Vatsala, we have developed this Vatsala Energy Transition Lab. And this is a free tool that you can here see the link that you are able to access. And then you can see, you can make your own analysis about what I have just shown. So moving on to, to the UK. So let's see what, what happened in the UK. This is again, a very interesting example where in the UK during last year, May and June period, they needed to stop completely their coal plants while they were also asking some units of the nuclear power plant to shut down. So, so similarly to what we have seen in the previous slide about the case of Germany, UK also in some days, they, the, the market price was negative, meaning that they needed to pay their, their neighbors to take excess electricity. So again, this is an example of how, you know, the energy transition, how the uh, renewable energy is actually changing the power system and how the role of gas is changing. So that's, that's where we wanted to show you, ladies and gentlemen, that renewable is coming, coming more and more, and is actually the change, changing the way that the power system behave. And here, I will just touch on this graph that really flexibility is important. And flexibility is one of the fastest growing sector in this energy transition. So I think all of us have seen now, and also from Caroline's presentation, that we see more and more growth in solar, in wind, so as renewable increase, as renewable becoming more and more the base load, what happened? So when renewable take the place of the base load, the role of gas is changing. So you see decline and also that there's decline in coal and oil. So, so now it means that when the role of gas is changing from the traditional base load and moving more towards a peak, uh, a peaking application or a balancing application, that's where you need to have more flexibility in the system. You need to have flexibility in order to balance that renewable, in order to, to, to enable this energy transition. And that's why we are saying that flexibility is a need. You can see that as a result, peaker gas, there's a big growth in, in peaker gas, as you can see, uh, that was 2030. Also, energy storage will increase. So really, that's something that is happening today. And, and, and we all need to be prepared for that. Because if you're not ready for that, you don't have your system is not flexible enough to enable more renewable, you can take more renewable, you will need actually to pay your neighbors to take excess power because the, your, your system will not be able to absorb that. So key thing here, ladies and gentlemen, is that flexibility is the key enabler for us in this energy transition. So in the past, we used to only have thermal power plants in the past. And everybody knows we have coal, we have gas. But nowadays, because of renewable, in a typical power system, we have renewable. So you have hydro, you have wind, you have solar, and you have, of course, your traditional legacy thermal power plant, coal, you have flexible gas, and now you have also energy storage batteries. So because of this new type of power mix, of this changing power mix, we need now to look at dynamic properties such as port load, minimum stable load, startup costs, startup time, and so on and so forth, to understand really what is really to be the overall cost of the system. Because in the past, it was very easy. You just look only at the capex and opex, that's it. But now, because that you have so many variable type of generation, renewable, peaker gas, and batteries, it's very important to look at dynamic properties so that you can better understand how flexible is your system. In the past, you used to look at how cheap or how efficient your system. But nowadays, ladies and gentlemen, you need to look at how flexible in the system. And that's why it's very important to look at dynamic properties of those technology to better understand your power system, 
when you do planning of your asset and future investment, because you want to invest in the right technology, which is flexible enough to enable more renewable in the system. So again, you might ask, what is flexibility? Because you have been talking about flexibility is a key feature of high renewable power system. So let me show you here on this graph, what exactly we mean by a flexible power plant. A flexible power plant need to have fast start. It means that when you need them to be online, it needs to be at least be able to move from 0% to 100% load in two minutes or even less. So really you need them to be have fast start. And then you need them to have to give you high efficiency uh, over a certain period of time, so base load. And then that you need also to be have load following capabilities, meaning that if suddenly the, the sun doesn't shine, there's a cloud or the wind doesn't blow, what you do, you need to do? You need to be able to actually to be able to react. And that's why sometimes you need to do, be able to do load following. So that if suddenly uh, you have sun, you should be able to ramp down your, your flexible gas power plant. And when the renewable output is actually uh, low, you should be able to ramp up. So that, that's what we mean by following the load, right? And then also you need to also have low load operation, meaning that you need to be able to be on hot standby or some of us understand. And finally, uh, you also need to do fast stop because you need to be able, like I said in the beginning, to be able to have fast stop when you want to, to be there, but you also need to actually to shut down fast so that you don't burn, uh, your flexible power plant doesn't burn fuel unnecessarily. So this is some of the key features of a flexible power plant. So now you have seen about what is happening in the market uh, globally in Europe, uh, what, what, what dynamic uh, pro, uh, um, properties and also about flexibility. So now let's take a, a case study uh, about this uh, 211 uh, megawatt Baker Inlet power plant. That's a flexible gas power plant uh, in South Australia. Why South Australia? We have chosen South, this reference in South Australia because South Australia is really a good example of a window to the future. It shows now what is happening now actually is actually what is going to happen in the future for many countries because South Australia is really at the forefront of the energy transition. As you can see here, the generation on that particular two days last year in South Australia was actually mainly on renewable, so 79% on renewable and 20% of gas. So you can see that there was no coal. And as Caroline mentioned, that you can see more and more coal declining. So this is a good way for us to see how the future will look like. But this is what happened last year. So here uh, you can see that on that particular day, there was a lot of renewable. As such, in order to balance this intermittency caused by renewable, you need to have false response. You need to have flexibility. And that's why the Baker Inlet plant was actually because it was a flexible peaking power plant, it was able to have fast response. And that's why such flexible peaking capacity is crucial to integrate more high renewable in the system. And you can see on the left side, those two power plants, the, uh, the Pelican Point and the Torres Island was actually running at very, very low plant factor. These are basal plants. And you know very well when base low plant run at such low uh, plant factor, they are really inefficient because they are running at very minimum load or very, very uh, close to the minimum. So really these are inefficient. And that's why you need to have a, a flexible gas power plant to be able to have faster, flexible enough and always running at maximum load at the best efficiency. So now, if you also stay on this uh, on, on, on this uh, this case, here you can see that 
for the Baker Inlet plant for the month of uh, March, April, May 2020, these are the number of daily stop stop that they have done. And, and enabled to, to increase, to increase when the renewable share increases, and that's where frequent start and stop is necessary. And here, as you can see, when we compared the Baker Inlet plant compared to the other, uh, the two other plant, the two traditional uh, basal plant, you can see that the Baker Inlet plant was the best start stop performer because it was the most flexible. And as a result, that's why it was operating more. So I hope that this give you, this case study give you a good example of what happened in power system where there's a high number of renewable, high, high penetration, and how the role of gas has changed from the traditional base load to a peaking application. And that's where being flexible enough will help you to integrate more renewable. So, so on this, I would like just to, to, to share that we Vatsala, we have various uh, flexible solution that actually provide base load for energy demand and balancing capacity to integrate more renewable. So here you can see some, some project that we have been working and supporting our customer uh, in, in, in Myanmar, uh, with MCM Power in Cambodia for the electricity of Cambodge, EDC, uh, and, and also uh, in, in Southeast Asia for this energy storage project, and also in Singapore, where we are, that our energy storage is actually helping Singapore towards moving towards a low carbon future. So, so on this, I, I thank you very much, and I really hope that if you need to remember something from this presentation, will be flexibility. Flexibility is the key enabler for the energy transition. So if you want to add more renewable in your power system, you need to have flexible power plant to support you. So please invest in the right technology. And if you have any question, please write it in the chat box, in the uh, uh, Q&A box, and we will be happy to take it later. So on this, thank you very much. And I will hand over back to Malin. Thank you very much. Thanks, Nico. But uh, Nicholas, but please also stay online. And uh, Caroline, if we can, uh, if we can get you um, to put on your video here as well. Let's let's move on to the panel. Um, yeah. Thanks. Well, first of all, thanks to to all the participants here for for your active participation. We have uh, a lot of questions coming in. Also, some good activity and discussion there in the um, in the chat box. So that's that's excellent. Um, uh, so let's uh, let's move on to the panel. Uh, we have a few topics and, and questions here to discuss. We're also gonna, you know, drag in some of your your great questions um, coming in through the Q and A here, um, and and of course also then get to to answering more of those later. Um, but let's let's perhaps start with the topic of of you know really the system wide topic also of 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 coal because a, a lot of the countries. Um, you know, in Southeast Asia, obviously, still have a, a large amount of coal-based capacity, are, are very, you know, still dependent on that for for uh, electricity and energy security. So, so clearly, it has a a role to play. Um, but we've also seen, seen like you talked about, Caroline, that that some countries are taking gradual steps towards reducing coal power. Um, yeah, are, are there any initiatives in the region for also early retirement of older, less efficient coal power plants? How do you see the sort of future of coal in Southeast Asia in, in, in general, um, Carolyn? Thanks for the question, Marlin. Uh, so in terms of the ambition from, or rather the intention of governments to um, retire coal plants early, we have heard of some intentions from countries like Thailand. You know, they are currently drafted their integrated energy blueprint uh, and they have uh, set to, that there will not be a, a rise in coal proportion in their power mix in the future. Um, and, and the early retirement of all gas and coal plants is something that they uh, may propose as well uh, for, for the next plan. And also in Indonesia, they've also discussed uh, a re retirement of inefficient plants or replacing coal plants or diesel plants with renewable energy or even 
one thing that we hear recently is the coal firing of uh, coal plants with biomass. So, so we, we, we do hear of this intentions, uh, but just to share is that we have not actually seen any firm plan being issued for you know, early retirement of coal plants uh, from any of this country. So right now, any intentions uh, are still verbal announcements, uh, limited to verbal announcements. And um, there are a few countries that are currently, you know, revising their their power development plans, and hopefully those plans, when released, will give us a better idea and, and clarity into, you know, the government's stance on new coal plants moving forward. I I think we also had a, a comment or a question here popping up that whether um, renewables and variable renewables are they really more competitive um, versus coal? I I think you may have addressed that in 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 your presentation as well, but perhaps you could comment on that. You know, are we there yet? Are we gonna come to that point? What's what's the current status? Yeah, but so so one thing that here at DNEF what we do twice a year is this uh, what we call the levelized cost of electricity analysis. Right, um, so we do that twice a year and what that exercise uh, includes is uh, analysts around the world actually go out into the market and we get you know, data from the ground, from developers, from everything from uh, CapEx of the different technologies, the OPEX, uh, the financing costs, uh, fuel costs, for example. And with this data point, we actually uh, come out with a levelized cost of electricity for each technology, which we then use to compare the competitiveness of each technology, and we also do a forecast uh, uh, of that into the future. Yeah. And, and what we find that uh, not every country is at the point uh, where you know new coal or solar plant is uh, cost competitive against uh, a coal or gas plant already. And that story looks different country to country depending on local conditions. Uh, you know, the excess or the domestic uh, availability of coal and gas can change that story quite quite significantly. Um, but we do see that the trend is in most countries, um, the cost of renewables are falling uh, to the point that they will eventually cross the cost of a new coal gas plant. And then if you earlier in my uh, presentation as well, I talked about a the concept of a second tipping point, which is you know when a new coal, uh, when a new solar wind plant gets competitive against running uh, an existing uh, coal or gas plant. Uh, we see that happen, as mentioned, uh, in some countries such as you know China and United States. Uh, we see that that is a more challenging tipping point to reach here in Southeast Asia, uh, in some countries, because right now um, the outlook for the price of coal um, is that it is still relatively low, especially in countries where there are uh, regulations put in place to cap the price of coal that's used for power generation. Um, the, the, the coal fleet here as well is still relatively young. So, you know, they're they are likely locked in the system for a longer period of time as well. So these points are harder to reach in some countries, uh, but towards, you know, towards the end of the outlook, we still see some countries reaching their second point. No, thank you. And, and yeah, I mean, I, I think that's um, good to remember also though, you know, a lot of the time financing and, and of course, sort of climate change and this is being highlighted and mentioned as, as, as sort of the major challenges and hurdles for coal. And, and of course, they're extremely important, but there's also these other sort of hurdles coming up, you know, the, the economics uh, driven, you know, by, by renewables, even though we may not be there yet in, in all countries. But uh, also as a, quen a consequence of, of more renewables, you know, decreasing capacity factors or uh, yeah, and an increased need for for ramping or or varying operational profiles, which which may be more more challenging. Um, um, then moving on to another interesting topic here, the um, yeah the, the the price of of new renewables. So you know some countries in the region we've seen very competitive prices, you know for 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 PV solar and wind, and in some countries it's um, it's still rather high. Um, you know, besides the issue of the renewable resource or, or the actual yield, um, why is this? Why do we see this difference, Carolyn? Oh, thanks again. Um, actually, maybe I, I see a question uh, in the Q&A chat that on PV module price, maybe what I'll do is I'll pull that question in and answer them together. 
Um, so when we look at LCOE, we look at different cost components, right? So everything from CapEx, OPEX, and financing costs. Um, so in most countries here in the region as well, we have seen CapEx pulling global prices uh, quite closely. So it is competitive, it follows the global trend. Um, but then there are places in the region like Indonesia, for example, where they impose local content rules, uh, but do not yet have a significant enough pipeline or deployment on the ground to really build out the domestic supply chain. And when you have these regulations to source uh, domestic components, uh, but do not have enough supply in the country, uh, this can drive up costs as well. And there are also other factors to consider, right? Such as the land availability and correspondingly, you know, the, the cost of land um, and what's the grid infrastructure that you need to build to your connection point, for example. Um, and different, the, the way that options uh, and tenders are designed differently in different countries can lead to very significant uh, dif uh, different results as well, such as in Cambodia, we saw that when the government helped to develop the land on which the product is to be built on, and they actually put in the investment to build the grid infrastructure out to the connection point, it really helped to de-risk the project significantly uh, and just cost down. But then in Vietnam, uh, you know, when the government issued a standard PPA template where, you know, a, a number of, of uh, lenders and investors, they have concern about, you know, some of the clauses and risks associated in the PPA. This can make access to cheap uh, or cheaper capital or longer duration loans or even non-risk cost loans very difficult. And so when you have a higher passive risk uh, involved for the project, this will ultimately lead to higher financing costs that drive the cost of projects up. So there are many factors that can you know, affect the LCO. It's not just really a, a CapEx story. Uh, it's it's a, a very holistic view that we take uh, across the different cost components. Uh, and now just to turn very specifically to the question on TV multi price trends and uh, will it reach the bottom? So we have we currently do not take the view that it will bottom out. Uh, we throughout the, you know, at least for, for our new energy outlook, we actually think that prices will continue on the downward trend. Uh, but if we revisit the, you know, the, the idea of a learning rate or experience curve, there is a certain percentage drop for the doubling of, you know, manufacturing capacity or, or in, in stock capacity, cumulative in stock capacity on the ground. And when that base uh, starts to increase and get to a large number, like, like now as compared to 10 years before, it gets more and more difficult to double that in stock capacity on the ground or to double the, the amount of solar panels that's being produced. Um, so while we expect that, you know, continued innovation and expansion of, of manufacturing capacity to meet demand would, would lead to, you know, continued economies of scale uh, and improvement, um, it gets harder and harder to, to double uh, the volume and hence the price drops would be, you know, less significant than what we saw in the past decade. Thanks, thanks, Carolyn. Um, then, then let's go to, to Vietnam um, quickly here, because obviously it's the region's largest and, and most active renewable market, like like we saw in, in, in Carolyn's presentation. Um, but we also have a question here online that what is done or could be done to reduce curtailment issues, you know, and, and perhaps taking that into a larger question, how can Vietnam tackle the high amount of renewables in the grid and, and, and to make sure to sort of balance that? Um, Nicholas. Yeah, thanks, Malin, for, for, for the question. I think uh, uh, Vietnam, having myself spent a lot of time in Vietnam, I think what Vietnam needs is that they need flexibility. And I think that's something it's so far have not been present in the PDP, uh, let's say, seven. So now we understand that they, they are now working on PDP number eight, and there are talks that uh, there will be inclusion of uh, flexible gas in, in the PDP number eight. And I think that's the right thing that that uh, uh, the the government is doing. And for example, if I refer to the the study by the Institute of, of Energy that they were recommending uh, in a public workshop that flexible gas is needed in order to help uh, this uh, uh, you know the integration of renewable and solving those uh, curtailment issue. And not only that, and also there was also a uh, sometime last month uh, USAID was actually working with Institute of Energy, 
where they also recommend that they will need to have flexibility, more flexibility. So I think definitely flexibility, flexible gas is needed uh, in Vietnam so that they can achieve this very aggressive plan of having more renewable, and, but yet still to be able that the uh, the system, the grid is able to, to take that. So yeah, that's my answer, Malin. And uh, continuing here on the topic of, of flexibility, we have a, a question. Um, in the, in the Q&A, how, how can we achieve net zero um, with renewables and a flexible gas plant? Um, Nico, Nicholas. Well, uh, yeah, thanks for the question. I think, you know, having net zero, I think the way I will uh, I look at that, I think, you know, we need to look at the whole system, you know, we, you know, we need to look at the whole system as it is. And I think that's where we, uh, Vatsala, we have used, you know, Plexus modeling to see the whole system and how actually we can, you know, be able to use uh, that tool to be able to see how the current assets. And I think I will also answer another question that was in the chat about uh, retiring. Uh, should we retire uh, coal fire plant? Can we make them hybrid or can we, you know, make them more flexible? And I think it's possible because I think, in some countries, there are existing assets, there are legacy assets, and unfortunately, they are there. So when we do this kind of you know, system modeling, we need to look at what each of those uh, generations can play a role. And, and that's where everybody will have a play a role. And I think that's where you can make, for example, a uh, coal fire plant be more flexible. For example, you could uh, have next to a coal fire plant, you could have in a storage, or you could have... Uh, a flexible gas power plant that, for example, can use uh, exhaust heat from the coal fire plant. So I think there's a lot of way, Malin, to actually to, to really do that. And I think every technology has a role to play. But what we are saying is that each technology needs to play the role that it's supposed to do. You know, like coal fire plant and traditional uh, inflexible gas power plant are meant to do base load. You can't make them do peaking applications. So that's where you need to have batteries, you need to have flexible gas to be able to do that. And if you are able to create that and optimize the whole system, the whole system cost, and that's why you're able to achieve a very, you know, competitive and very flexible and optimized uh, power system, Malin. Yeah. Now, thanks. Um, thanks, Nico. And that, that's obviously the, you know, achieving an optimal system as optimal as possible uh, in, at the moment and in the next sort of five, ten years. Perhaps to add still to the question about net zero and, and how that's possible in the in the long run, um, you know, in, we, we, we've done a bit of work and modeling on that as well. And and of course, uh, if the price in renewables continues dropping, you know, it's, it's, it's possible and feasible to see that we, we can have systems that are going to be renewable baseload, um, you know, energy storage, but certainly we also see that there is a role to play for dispatchable uh, technologies for, okay. for flexible gas. But, you know, in the long run to make that net zero, it also means that the fuels need to decarbonize. So we will need to use green hydrogen or, uh, you know, synthetic methane or, or other carbon neutral fuels in the, in the long run. Yeah, thanks. Um, Perhaps uh, continuing on the on the topic then of, of battery energy storage, uh, and, and we had some some questions online that we can perhaps also also get to. But uh, yeah, first of all, you know, which countries in the region are really taking the lead here in terms of of the energy storage project pipeline, Nicholas? Yeah, so thanks, Mandy, for the question. I think uh, energy storage has really picked up in Southeast Asia, and I think in terms of uh, you know which country. Is leading personally. I see that the Philippines is really uh, at the forefront, and we have been seeing several announcements of of project being announced and committed project by the the, uh, the DOE. So I would say that Philippines is at the forefront. Uh, we're also seeing Singapore with uh, their their testbed project in Singapore, but of course on a much smaller scale. Uh, but we're also seeing uh, the likes of Indonesia, who's actually catching up on that, and also Malaysia. So I would say that. Every nation in Southeast Asia is actually looking at uh, energy storage, but I would say that is the Philippines which is really leading that race. And I'm sure that uh, in, in in a couple of years you will have other nations like uh, Vietnam or that will catch up. So so definitely uh, it's really that now energy storage is the hot topic here, and I would say it will continue to 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 be because of the influx of renewable in the system here. 
and and you know in the in the q and a we've also seen a, a couple of questions about you know the competitiveness of energy storage and another one uh, you know asking us here to to compare and contrast a bit between energy storage and gas speakers so how how does that work and um nicholas maybe you can start but carolyn if you have some insight as well you yeah. know which will be the winner will it be both how do you see that yeah well, thanks for the question i, I think for, for for us uh we need to look at it at you know what adds value to the customer we need to look at every project is different we need to look at what is what the customer needs what keeps the customer awake at that what is going to add value so then we need to look at the, the, does he or she has access to land have the fuel because if you don't access to fuel you can't bring LNG, you can't bring pipe gas to them. That's it. Then you know that the flexible is out. Then you need to look at energy storage. And then you need to look at what really problem we're trying to solve. So, so for me, it's really doing the proper life cycle costs, looking at what makes sense, what add value. And after that, we can propose because we should not go and rush and always say that oh, flexible gas will work or it's energy storage. So for, for us, we need to take a structured approach and see what would add value to the customer so so yeah so that's what i have to say maybe uh, caroline maybe you want to add something from your side on that also yeah sure though i fully agree with what nicholas said i think it's you know when we do modeling uh for our new energy outlook uh report we actually look at countries from bottom up and that's because every country has a very different you know uh, local conditions and nuances and what this means is when we come to comparing, you know, the cost competitiveness of different technologies or different flexible uh, technologies, what we have then have to look at is things like, you know, the, the load profile of um, the country itself, because every country has very different load profile when the peak happens, uh, how long does the peak last for? And this can change uh, what is the most sensible technology, for example, Battery storage is very good at shifting generation, uh, you know, from, from different time hours. So this can be very useful for countries, you know, maybe for, again, using Vietnam as an example, where they currently now have a lot of uh, generation during, you know, the, the, the afternoon hours, because that's when the sun is the strongest. But if you look at the low profile of the country, they have a lot of morning and evening peak time when people, you know, get up in the morning and, and reach at home. So that's when battery can come in and help shift this generation uh, from the midday to, to meet the evening peak, for example. But then in countries where the peak hours tend to go a bit longer or beyond, you know, four hours to five hours, then that maybe that's when peaker gas come in and makes more sense mm. because it then gets very expensive for a battery system to try and meet these long um, peak uh, peaking requirements. So, uh, yeah, different technologies, different solutions for, for slightly different problems. Um, Clear. Um, all right. Um, our hour here is, is, is coming to an end. Um, you know, I, I know there's lots of great, really great questions in the, in the Q&A that, that we haven't had time to, to address about various different technologies and, and other issues. Um, so, sorry about that for, for running out of time. But thank you very much, Carolyn and, and Nicholas. And thanks also to ADA Insights. Um, and of course, you know, a, a big thank you to, to you, the participants here online. Um, it's been great questions and, and great interactions here with you. Um, you will receive the recording of this webinar in a few days. Hopefully we can also continue the, the discussion uh, offline with, uh, with, with some of you. If you found this webinar interesting and you would like to dive deeper into some of these challenges facing power systems in Southeast Asia, um, we will be doing exactly that in the coming couple of months uh, with a webcast series of shorter view on demand videos, diving into topics like power system modeling, flexibility, market mechanisms, energy storage and, and hybrid power plants. And, and so, so keep a lookout for that. Um, all right, have a wonderful afternoon, day or morning, depending on where you are in the world.